So my first question would be, how does someone become an astronaut? I think uh, with some determination and a lot of luck mm -hmm. and some intent on uh, setting goals and following through with uh, education and uh, just keeping in sight some long-term plans. Yeah, it's, but it does take a lot of luck as well because we have few opportunities for astronauts right now. Yeah. It's probably a childhood dream for a lot of people. So how do you feel achieving what all of the small kids and girls actually want to become? Well, I, again, I feel lucky and <clears throat> fortunate to have this opportunity. I think it's a, it's a dream. It is a dream of a lot of young kids. It was a dream of mine when I was young to, mm -hmm. to work in the space program. So I just feel very fortunate and uh, I feel the obligation to do the work that we do because I've had an opportunity, been given the opportunity. Yeah. So you were one of the kids who actually were, was like, I'm going to be an astronaut, and it happened. I believed I would work in the human space exploration program when I was young. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm, it's, it worked out. So far, so good. So why do you think exploration of space is important? Uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, much of the research that, well, all of the research that we do in space is really intent on making life better for humans on Earth. There's all types of research that's uh, been documented over the years by NASA and other organizations um, that we're aware of. And, but I also think that it's important for humans to develop the capabilities to live elsewhere, to have other options for, um, for living besides Earth. I don't, I don't think, I don't, at NASA we never think uh, that you should just have one solution, you know, there should always be a backup plan. And I think that's true of humans in our, our own existence as well. Oh, that's really, really interesting because it kind of leads me to another question. Stephen Hawking said that um, we will destroy our planets eventually and we will have to explore space and uh, make settlements at different planets. What do you think about that? Well, there was another great explorer by the name of John Young, astronaut John Young, who uh, was one of the pioneers in space exploration. And I always used to hear him say that single planet species don't last forever. And if you don't believe that, just ask the dinosaurs. So the dinosaurs were here and now they're not. And they were a single planet species. And right now we are a single planet species. So, so. we don't want to be like them. I don't think so, yeah. It's not our generation. I think it will be generations to come, but it just depends on, you know, what, you, what do you think the long-term plan should be? Mm -hmm. You talked a bit about the research done in NASA. Mm -hmm. uh, I, if I understand it correctly, you yourself do some research while being in the space. So what is some of the most interesting stuff that you've done? Well, our job in space is not, to, not necessarily to um, design research or bring experiments to space. Our job is to operate experiments in space. Uh, we, over the course of being on space station for six and a half months, uh, our crews operated more than 350 experiments, some of which we really don't even know what it is we're doing. <laughs> um, for example, there was some uh, honeybees in space with us in a small container that we could never see because it was a closed container. So we don't really even know what they were doing in there. I just know that I moved them from one place to another and made sure that their equipment was operating nominally and that so some researcher designed this experiment and we just took care of it. So a lot of, in many cases, that's what we do. Um, so there are other times where we know the research we're doing, but still we're not, um, we don't design the, mm -hmm. the science, we simply operate it. Um, we did some cancer research, we did some reproductive research, we grew some, uh, some vegetables, some flowers, some weeds, um, we worked on mice, rodents in space, so many different things every day, it's always something new. So you help to answer a question, what does a honeybee do in space? <laughs> yeah, I, but I don't know question. because I couldn't see, <laughs> oh, yeah. I couldn't see the honeybees. Yeah. So do you think that people will land on Mars? Uh, absolutely. I have no doubt in my mind that we will put humans on Mars. When is it going to happen? Do you have uh, any estimates? I think we will see humans on Mars within the next 
maybe 10 to 15 years, maybe less. I don't know. Would you like to go? Uh, yeah, I would go to Mars if I knew that, uh, if I understood the, um, the systems that were in place to protect us and bring us home, if I knew that uh, we had reliable uh, propulsion systems, rockets, and life support systems and that, that were well tested, sure. I would not go if I thought it was a one-way trip. Mm -hmm. I'm not ready to leave Earth yet, permanently. Mm -hmm. Do you think we will have settlements on Mars? Um, I don't know. It depends on how we develop our space program. I, I think Mars is, offers an opportunity for us to do that, but clearly with no atmosphere that we can exist in, it, it'll be difficult. We, we could have settlements on the moon just the same. It wouldn't mm -hmm. be much different than being on Mars some different life support systems or, uh, you know, protection for temperature extremes or something. But um, I think in that case, you could either be on the moon or Mars. There's no atmosphere for us in either of those places, so. So why do you think it's so exciting to explore space and other planets? Why do people get so crazy about that? Well, I mean, it's just discovery, right? Humans have questions we always have. That's how we learned about the, our own world that we live in. And, um, you know, science and science fiction and uh, the excitement that we create with animations and movies and, you know, those things get people interested and, uh, you know, the future awaits and we have the capability, so, why not? Do you teach your kids how to become an astronaut? Um, no, I mean, my kids, my, my kids grew up watching me become an astronaut and, and do my job. Uh, my, my children are grown now, they're in their early 20s. And um, one of them is interested in being an astronaut and the other, I think, is also interested, but maybe indirectly, maybe in an indirect way, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But they've grown up with the space, human space program and um, are always uh, interested and motivated by anything that has to do with space and space research and human exploration. Yeah. I can't really imagine telling my friends being at high school and telling them that my dad is away, you know, he's in space. Uh, <laughs> it must be really... Well, where my children grew up, Everybody worked in the space program. So if I say to you, my dad's an astronaut, and you say, well, my dad's a flight director or an uh -huh. astronaut trainer or prepares food for astronauts or packs their clothing or writes their procedures. So everybody has the same association. It's very common even to have friends with parents that are astronauts. Oh, okay. So it's not unusual <laughs> where we live. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. And I understood that your wife also works in the field. Uh, no, she does not. She is a uh, speech language pathologist, log oh, really? logoped. Yeah, I mean, she clearly works in the field because she's closely associated with the things that I do, uh -huh. um, and is, has always supported the space program in different ways, directly and indirectly. But she's not an employee of NASA. Mm -hmm. So, what effects does uh, spending time in space have on your biological clock? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, we have to force ourselves to live by a clock because we mm -hmm. see 16 cycles of sunrise and sunset every day. So if we mm -hmm. look out the window, it's constantly light and dark all the time throughout our normal day. So we sleep according to our watch and we work according to our watch. And uh, it takes a little bit of time to get accustomed to that. but. As long as the, the shift is not too great, we, when, we, when we launch from Baikonur, we try to be shifted to that time zone and, and then maybe adjust a little bit before we leave. The time we use is Greenwich Mean Time in space. That allows us to work part of our day during the time when uh, Russia is awake and active and part of our day that during the time when the United States is awake. So each control center can have some working time with the crew during the day. Mm -hmm. So, but the adjustment is just simply working by the clock and when it's nighttime, we climb inside of our sleep quarters and turn out all the lights and put some earplugs in and just go to sleep. Mm -hmm. So, you get used to it. 
Have you any? Have you ever had any problems with the solitude, just being there in a um, small space? Not really. We were together with five other crew members, mm -hmm. so, um, and I think we're all conditioned and have um, have the right expectations of what that will be like. Mm -hmm. um, we also, even in choosing astronauts. Uh, try to do some psychological evaluations to make sure that people will be okay in those mm. environments and not claustrophobic or anxious or anything like that. So I think we're, you know, if, if you don't want to live in that place, you probably don't want to, you wouldn't sign up to be an astronaut. So you mm. have some expectation to be living in these con confined environments. And, and I must ask about the zero gravity. Is it fun? It is fun. Um, everything we do is fun. But after some period of time, you start to realize that you have no options for rest. You can never rest in space. You're always floating. So your body um, never has a chance, as it does on Earth, to relax, to lay down, mm -hmm. to feel like you're taking a break. You're always floating. You're floating when you're working. You're floating when you're sleeping. You're floating when you're watching movies. You're floating when you're using the bathroom. You're floating when you're trying to take a shower. You're floating all the time. So there's no, there's no relief from that. So it's amazing, and it's an incredible part of what we do, that microgravity environment. But it is challenging because you don't ever have a chance to rest. Your body is always in the same. Your muscles are always slightly contracted in this natural state that your body Mm -hmm. assumes when there's no forces on it. And that itself can become challenging. That's really interesting because I wouldn't think people really think about it. I didn't think on. about it either till <laughs> about three months into space flight and uh, after the, the longer mission, I thought, okay, this is, now this is a problem. It's, not a, it's, it's amazing, but also creates challenges. So yeah. it's amazing that you can pretty much fly, but you cannot lie down. You can never not fly. You are always flying. That's the problem, yeah. That's so, really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so how did you like your stay in the Czech Republic? Uh, it's great to be back. This is not the first time we've been here. Obviously, we've been here uh, two previous times during the, the first two missions, and we've come many times on our own personal uh, visits as well. So we, we love being here. It's a good time of the year. It's spring. Mm -hmm. um, the food is great. The people are great. Of course, the beer is great too, so <laughs> it's good to be here, but uh, it's been very enjoyable and visiting the different parts of the, of the country this time. It's the first time we had been to uh, um, Olomouc mm -hmm. and uh, Ostrava, and so that's wonderful experiences there to learn about those cities and the universities and the things that they're doing at those schools. Uh, and, and I hope that we had some good outreach and uh, motivation and education for the people there about what we're doing in human space flight. Um, to, to continue to get uh, people of all ages, especially kids, excited about their future and thinking about their, their long-term goals. So what was your schedule like? Uh, busy, mm -hmm. but that's, uh, that's the way we plan it. We try to have uh, activities each day where we're making a presentation. Um, of course, we just traveled today back from uh, um, Ostrava and uh, we have some events tonight and then we return tomorrow to Brno. Uh, where we have a presentation in the evening, so we, it's it's busy. We try to um, we try to s typically see universities or schools or science centers at, at each time and and gather the crowds to talk about the work that we do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, how is the cooperation with the Czech Academy of Sciences? Well, the Czech Academy of Sciences are the ones who brought us here, and we're very thankful of that they've done a wonderful job of coordinating the work, uh, working with NASA to. Um, make sure that the, uh, the schedules were appropriate and that the outreach was effective. And so uh, uh, we're really happy about the, uh, the time that we spent and the, the interest that the Academy of Sciences has generated uh, and just to bring us back here and, and uh, you know, share the stories. Mm. What was the benefit of the whole event, your visit? Well, I think we have to leave that to the people to decide, but the benefit, we hope the benefit was that we've inspired people. And also um, provided knowledge and information, uh, firsthand information from somebody like myself who has experience in space so that people understand what it is we're doing and what it is we 
plan to do uh, and why space exploration is important. So I think the benefit is education and uh, motivation to continue to follow uh, the truths of science and, and make sure that we understand uh, how science is important and engineering is important for our future, for the future of humans on, on Earth. Have you ever heard the Houston, we've got a problem? <laughs> Have you ever heard it been said on the radios? On the, <laughs> no, no, we've never said that. And I've never said that myself. So that's probably Maybe not good directly, thing. yeah. <laughs> yep. yeah. Hi, I'm astronaut Drew Foistel. Happy to be back in the Czech Republic. And I would just like to say, Zdravim, Shekni, Vanushki. <laughs> Did I almost that's get good. it? Yeah, that's, that's good. That's good. We, we're going to use it. It's really good. Zdravim, Shekni, Vanushki, Zviera. <laughs>